Okay, so second workshop on assets and bases for grade 11s. Last time I saw you, last week, okay, we introduced assets and bases. I'm going to very, very quickly, it's my style of teaching, I like to go back and just revise quickly and then we move forward. So we, we looked at the, the basic characteristics physical characteristics between acids and bases. Acids tend to be sour on the tongue. Bases tend to be soapy. Okay. Uh, acids are very corrosive with metals. They turn blue litmus paper red and bases turn red litmus paper blue. We'll still learn more about that later on. Thank you very much. We'll still learn more about that later on in this course. And uh, when they mix with each other, it takes away the acidity or the alkalinity. We then, we then looked at common acids, laboratory acids. Obviously, there's many, many, many different types of acids in the world that we live in, right? But we, we looked at the, the ones that we need. Hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, phosphoric acid, ethanoic acid, sulfurous acid and oxalic. So those you need to know. You need to know them and you need to know their, their formula. Okay. Generally speaking, the strong acids we work with are these three. All right. HCl, SO4, HNO3. All right. Those are the, the strong acids that we work with. They're not the only strong acids. There are many strong acids. You can get super strong acids. Okay, but the acid, the string, the strong acids we work with are these. Okay, uh, then you get the weak acids. The two weak acids that we generally work with are these two: uh, ethanoic and oxalic. Okay, but there are others as well. There are some that sit in between. Some are, 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 are seem to be defined as weak, but they're actually quite dangerous. Um, so we're trying to, we're sort of using a binary approach of strong and weak, but in actual fact, it's a continuum. If you go to university and you study acids and bases and chemistry, you'll learn very, very quickly about Ka and Kb values. And the higher the Ka value, the stronger the acid, and the higher the Kb value, the stronger the base. And the lower the Ka and Kb values, the weaker the acids and the bases are. All right. Now, we are going to work with acids and bases in the context of water being the solvent. But the water in, 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 in certain cases is more than just a solvent. It actually becomes a reactant, especially with acids. Right, so last week we, we looked at the difference between concentrated and dilute acids. Right, a dilute acid is one in which there's a great deal of water, the solvent present per mole of acid, and a concentrated acid is where there's a large amount of water, uh, is where there's a small amount of water present compared to the amount of acid molecules present. Please note that concentrated doesn't mean strong, and weak, dilute doesn't mean weak. We then looked at ionization of acids, right, and we spent quite a bit of time on that, and I can't emphasize enough how important ionization and dissociation equations are in this particular topic. Because when it comes to doing pH calculations later on, and when it, uh, in particular pH calculations later on, you need to know your ionization equations. All right, so generally speaking, an ionization equation for an acid, you have your acid, your acids will all have hydrogen in them. Uh, when you have an ionization, the hydrogen, a hydrogen ion is donated to the water. And remember, a hydrogen ion is basically just a proton, because an atom of hydrogen is one proton, one electron. So if you take the electron away, it's a proton. Leaves you with an acidic anion, and it leaves you with the hydronium ion. Now, the hydronium ion is, in essence, what makes an acid an acid. When you have hydronium ions in solution, your acid is 
in business. Okay. As it sits here, it's uh, some of them are gases, hydrogen chloride is a gas. But once it's, re once it's in water and it reacts with water, it ionizes, that hydronium ion becomes nasty. Okay. So we, there is a definition of an acid. We did do a definition of an acid. That there it is. An acid is defined as a substance that releases hydrogen ions in water. All right? Um, but we're going to, today, we're going to look at two very definite theories of acids and bases. The one's called the Arrhenius theory, which this falls under. The other one is known as the Bronsted-Lowry or the Lowry-Bronsted model which is very, very powerful and the one, the main one that we use. All right. We looked at the different ionization equations. We looked at HCl, which is the most common acid, the one that's in our tummies as well. It's pool acid, that when you have an effective collision between an acid molecule and a water molecule, then the hydrogen ion of the acid leaves forming hydronium ion and it leaves behind the negative electron with the chlorine to make that a chloride ion and that forward step is known as ionization because ions are formed these two substances are not ionic they are covalently molecular they are molecular because they only have covalent bonds the reverse reaction when you have an effective collision between the two products, you land up with something called recombination. Now, we haven't done chemical equilibrium yet. You will do it later on this year. But when your forward reaction is much stronger than your reverse reaction, you have a strong acid. All right? You have a strong acid. So you can think of it a bit like a rugby match on Saturday's rugby match versus Somerset College. This was Parkland's going in that direction to score on that side. And this opposite direction was Somerset College trying to score on the other side. And the one side dominated over the other. So when your ionization is very much stronger than your recombination, you have a strong acid. The same is true with the base. You have a strong base when the dissociation process is much more dominant than the reverse recrystallization. We'll get to that. So... Hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, you can see they have strong ionizations. All right? Uh, they are both monoprotic because only one hydrogen ion is donated per molecule of acid. All right? They're known as monoprotic acids, monos meaning one. Right? When we come to ethanoic acid, ethanoic acid is also monoprotic. But due to the nature of its chemical bonds and energy and entropy and all of that sort of thing that hangs behind the scenes, it is a weak acid. In other words, it's not easy for this hydrogen to just leave this ethanoic acid molecule. All right? But if there is a big enough energy, what they call an activation energy, if the activation energy is overcome, the hydrogen ion will actually move across and you will get the hydronium ion and what they call the ethanoate ion or the acetate ion. Okay, so this acid is known as ethanoic acid, but the old name for it is acetic acid. You don't need to know this yet because you haven't done organic chemistry yet. Okay, all right, the reason why it's F is because it's got two carbons. If it was meth, it would have one carbon. If it was prop, it would have three carbons. Beautiful, pent five, etc. You'll learn about that. All right. Now, so in general, there is a general equation for acids reacting with water. The water is a reactant. Forward reaction is ionization. Reverse reaction is recombination. Okay. We're revising, but it's very important. Sulfuric acid is known as a diprotic acid and it's diprotic because it donates two hydrogen ions all right but not at the same time as you will soon enough see but it has to donate it donates two hydrogen ions separately to two water molecules 
There was a very good question as to why this doesn't happen. It's got to do with the fact that energetically this is not stable. Bringing in two protons into this molecule is not going to be stable. They're going to repel each other. The maximum that a water molecule will take is one hydrogen ion for it to be stable. It's what we call a hydronium ion. Some old textbooks call it oxonium ion. We don't use that terminology. We use hydronium. This is a diprotic acid. We are going to come back to this. We are going to look at how this actually is a two-step process. But we'll do that when we do Bromstead, Lowry, acids and bases. All right, this is a strong acid because the ionization dominates over the recombination. We also get weak acids that are diprotic. For instance, carbonic acid. This is known as carbonic carbonate. It donates two hydrogen ions, but the recombination is much higher than the ionization. Right, so this we will come back to after you have done chemical equilibria. Once you've done chemical equilibrium constants. Right, and that will probably be when we revise toward, uh, when we revise acids and bases, possibly next year. All right, then let's talk about bases and alkalis. Now, bases are the oxides of hydrox or hydroxides of metals. Not all bases dissolve nicely in water, right? A lot of your metal oxides are insoluble in water. But all your hydroxide compounds of, met of metals are soluble in water, all right? Well, let's say most of them. Something like lead hydroxide wouldn't be, but we never work with lead hydroxide, okay? So we generally work with... Uh, group 1 and group 2, every now and then maybe group 3, aluminium hydroxide, but that's about it. Okay. These are soluble in water, so we give them the name alkali. And alkali is in actual fact a soluble base. So the basis is a broader term. Alkalis are a subset. Alkalis are the soluble bases. However, in our course, we are going to call all the alkalis bases because we're not going to deal with insoluble bases. All the bases we deal with are going to be alkalis. We're just going to call them bases. Okay. Right. So, bases don't ionize because they are already ionic before they actually react. All right. We learned here that bases in essence are ionic magnesium oxide metal plus non-metal gives is an ionic bonding sodium hydroxide sodium is a metal the hydroxide ions made up of oxygen and hydrogen which are non-metals so when we look at our alkalis our bases x y and solids when we dissolve them in water, they are already ionic. Ions are not being formed. So this is not ionization. All right? It's not ionization. Ionization is the process of taking something that's molecular and creating ions. This is already ionic. When we mix it with water, the water dissociates the the, the the lattice of the, of the base. And so we land up with the solution. But please note that the water molecules do not change their molecular structure. You see, with acids, they took on a hydrogen ion and the H2O became H3O+. plus. There was an actual change in the molecular structure. So the water here is not a reactant. It is a solvent. So therefore, when we write these dissociation equations, we do not put the water on the left-hand side of the arrow because it is not a reactant. It is a solvent. So XY solid plus H2O gives us X plus and Y minus, and the water is sitting in the AQ. The reverse reaction is recrystallization. Okay. Cool. So we then looked 
at group one dissociation equations, all right? And we see that group one, basically strong bases. The, uh, the recrystallization is very small and the dissociation is dominant, all right? Produces the metal ions and the hydroxide ions. Group two is a bit of a mix between strong and not so strong, all right? We basically can assume that they're strong, but all of them are strong, all right? Uh, strong to weak, we work with KV values of higher up, but you need to know those, all right? And so there was a question as to why do we land up with two OH minuses? Because in the crystal lattice, for every one beryllium ion, there are two hydroxide ions. So when the crystal lattice breaks up, you get double the amount of hydroxide ions free as what they are beryllium, magnesium, or calcium ions. It's stoichiometry, all right? That formula unit, for every one of those formula units, you have one beryllium and you have two hydroxide ions. Super important, because when we work with pH and pOH, this ratio of one is to two is key for pH calculation. All right, so you must understand this. There's the crystal lattice. There's the ratio in the crystal lattice when the water frees it. One calcium, two hydroxides. Okay, cool. Now we move on. But before we move on, maybe I should just talk about dilute and concentrated. Once again, a weak base can be concentrated. So a concentration is about how much solute versus solvent. So if you have a concentrated base, it means there's a lot of base compared to the amount of water. The base can be a weak base, like aluminium hydroxide, but it can be concentrated, all right? You can have a strong base like sodium hydroxide, but it can have been a lot of water, so therefore it is strong but it's dilute okay so dilute means a lot of solvent small amount of the solute which would be the base all right now there is one and this used to frustrate me to no end when i did chemistry at university are the exceptions to the rule there is one base that does iron and we have to do we have to look at it okay so i would like us before we move on before we go here i would like us to look at the exception to the rule now the rule is what rule the rule that bases dissociate and the exception to the rule is ammonia so you have N, and you have H. So this is what we call ammonia NH3. Right, now NH3, when it reacts with water, You know this is water it reacts with the water all right now notice that ammonia is in actual fact a molecule which implies it is non-ionic all right it is these are covalent bonds nitrogen is a non-metal hydrogen is a non-metal so it's, it's a covalent bond. Whereas the water, hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen, also non-ionic. It is a covalent substance. So what happens here is the following. When there's a collision, one of these hydrogens, one of these hydrogens actually transfers 
to the lone pair of the ammonia molecule. There's a transfer of a hydrogen ion or a proton, okay? So what we land up with, and it's a very weak ionization. So this is a base. This is a base. We'll see later on why it's a base, okay? The ionization is weak, all right? The recombination is strong. It's got a very dominant recombination in reverse. What it produces is the following. So we have a lone pair there. We have three bonding pairs. We have three bonding pairs. But the hydrogen ion that comes across there <coughs> now lands up creating the ammonium ion. This is the ammonium ion. We call this the ammonia, not ammonia, ammonium ion. Now you would have come across the ammonium ion in grade nine. It would have been one of the complex ions that Dr. Rousseau wanted you to remember. It's a positive polyatomic ion. All right. So it's one of those H3O plus and NH4 plus are the on school level are the positive complex ions that we come into contact with. What it leaves is interesting because what it leaves is it leaves something that is familiar to us, which should be familiar to us. It leaves, sorry, this one, not there, this one is there. It leaves a minus, a negative, because you see where this was neutral, because the amount of electrons and the amount of protons in the molecule were equal. Now the hydrogen nucleus has left, leaving behind the electron of the hydrogen which means there's one more electron in that molecule than there are protons. Ah, this is what we call the hydroxide ion. This is known as the hydroxide ion. Now, if something produces a hydroxide, it's an alkali. The fact that ammonia produces the hydroxide ion when it reacts with water makes it an Arrhenius base, which we're going to get to now. All right. This is a base because when it dissolves in water, it actually reacts with the water to produce hydroxide ion. And according to the Arrhenius model, which we're going to look at right now, that makes it a base. But it's a base. This is a base that ionizes. Yes. So, so I just want to ask, without the Lewis diagrams, how would you write this? Very like good, Lewis. very good question. Thank you for asking that. So this would be NH3 plus H2O, right? It would have a weak ionization. It would have a strong recombination. This is going to produce NH4, and it's going to be plus, and it would then be plus OH minus. This is normally a gas, this is a liquid. And these two are going to be aqueous because not all the water is going to react. There's still going to be a lot of water that is pure water. That's going to be normal water molecules. So this will be, these ions will still be in water. But some of the water will react with the ammonia to produce these two. And so... So Tamlin's answer, a question was a very good one. So what we would do is we would say, okay, yeah, we're going to have that the water donates 
a hydrogen ion and a proton, proton or a proton. Yes, Isabella. So, so because of ionic water, we don't, we can write the H2O on the left. Oh, yes. You see, so this is the water here does serve as a solvent, but it also there's a part of it that actually reacts. And therefore, we put it not on top of the arrow, we put it to the left of the arrow because it actually is a reactant. It's an exception, though, because generally bases, when we say bases, we mean alkalis, they don't ionize because they're already ionic. But this base is not ionic when it, it's in the original form. So it does ionize. It's an exception. Okay, by the way, we're going to come back to all of these pretty soon. Is there any acid that dissociates? Not that I know of, but I'm not a chemist. Okay, yeah. In my limited knowledge of chemistry, there's not one that I know of, but what I do know is that I, there's a lot, there's an infinite amount that I don't know. So there could be. I just don't know. So Dr. Rousseau is just smarter than me, just generally. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rousseau is actually physics and chemistry, but I think he's more chemist. Whereas, like, I'm more physicist, he's more chemist, but his physics is very good. Mr. Himon is more chemist than a physicist, but he's completely goo goo about physics. So. <laughs> All right, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, my training, my training lies in physics and mathematics. Dr. Rousseau's training is, is physics and chemistry, and Mr. Himon's is, is mainly chemistry and biology. But I, I'm, I'm the mathematician because I did a degree in mathematics. I don't think they did degrees in math. Okay, but we all together, we just make a wonderfully beautiful, handsome couple of <laughs> old dudes that try to teach science. Okay, all right, so let's now look at theories of acids and bases. Okay, so the theory of Arrhenius, we've actually already done. All right, so the Arrhenius theory is the theory, these are the theories of acids and bases. So the Arrhenius theory, we just look at the definitions. All right, so the definition of an acid in the Arrhenius theory is it's a substance that produces hydrogen ions when it dissolves in water. An acid is a substance that produces hydrogen ions or hydronium ions when it dissolves in water. Now, some teachers, I know Dr. Rousseau likes to, he likes to just deal with the hydrogen ion. Basically, it releases hydrogen ions. It's true it releases hydrogen ions. I personally feel it's, for me, I prefer it if I'm, I, I, I talk about the hydronium ion. Okay, that, that hydrogen ion isn't free. It's sitting piggybacking or hitchhiking on a water molecule. Okay, and I think the reason for that is, is that, is that chemists, You'll sometimes see this, and please be careful of this, because I know this confused the absolute hell out of me. And that's why I'm fuss about the hydronium ion. Is, you know, if you, if you look at chemists, they will say NaCl, right, plus water gives you Na plus and Cl minus. Okay, and this is in actual fact aqueous, aqueous. All right, so they'll do this, they'll write a dissociation like that. Okay, cool. Now, I know that because I'm not a chemistry wasn't my thing, uh, you'll find that there are chemists that will actually write this. You got a, that looks, no, oh, that looks like, hmm, like that. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Is, this thing is not ionic. This is this is covalent. This is not an ionic substance. This is the this this is dissociation. All right, but this is ionization. There's something invisible happening there. That's that there, and that's why I like to do this. I like to actually put in the water. But if you put the water in, then the eight, you've, got to put, you've got to put the water in, then you're going to land up with H3O plus 
plus CL minus. All right. There are notes that go around, and there's textbooks that write it like that because the assumption is that you're good enough at, at chemistry to know that this isn't a dissociation, that there's water in the background. I'm too dumb a chemist in order for me to do that. All right, so maybe that's one of the advantages of me teaching you this at the moment is because I'm not great at chemistry, so I know how easily I got confused by this, so I'd rather teach you explicitly explicitly the water you know the ionization with the water like that okay so i i normally teach my classes all right that an acid is a substance that produces hydronium ions when it dissolves in water okay it's not wrong to teach that it produces hydrogen ions because it does the hydrogen ions are piggybacking on the back of water molecules a base, according to the according to the Arrhenius definition, is a substance that produces hydroxide ions when it dissolves in water. All right. Now we have already encountered that, so I can we can go back to our ionization equations and we can clearly see that every one of those ionization equations for acids produced hydronium ions. Agree? And every one of the alkalis that we've dealt with produces hydroxide ions. So, according to the Arrhenius theory, that's acid and bases. But there was a problem. As they went further in their studies, they came to realize that not all substances that are acid or base necessarily explicitly satisfy these definitions. All right, and that is why we go to this baby here. The Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases. Now, the Bronsted should actually have a... the Scandinavian O. All right, when I was at school, back when Noah and I did chemistry together, we used to call it the Lowry-Bronsted model. Today, I see they call it the Bronsted-Lowry model. I don't know why doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. But the Bronsted-Lowry model is beautiful. An acid is a proton donor. And a base is a proton acceptor. It's as simple as that. And when we go back and we look at the ionization equations, you're going to see that it satisfies that too. Right, so the definition of the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid is that an acid is a proton donor. It's a substance that donates protons in chemical reactions. And a base is a proton acceptor. It is so sophisticated, it is actually simple. It's beautiful. And I'm going to show you how, how beautiful it actually is. Yes. So, sir, in the test, would they ask us to give, say, the yes. specific yes. theory? We can the ask you, give the definition of an Arrhenius acid. Uh, or give the definition of a Bronsted Lowry acid. Uh, and for those of you who go to university, there's actually something called the Lewis acid and the Lewis base as well. There's, there's another, there's a Lewis acid and base theory as well. But that is weird because that's about electron donation and, and I don't understand it. I'm not a good enough chemist. So the actual chemist use a different type of uh, model? So, so it's, it's just like it's the nature of science. You take physics, I don't want to digress, it's not a physics workshop. As we progress in our knowledge of the universe and phenomena in it, we realize that the models that we use we can reach a boundary where there is a limitation, like presently, right now, where we are now. The standard model of matter, which is exquisite, has reached a boundary. It doesn't explain dark matter. We need to now develop another model. 
And so models are approximations of gravity. It's like gravity. Gravity, Newton's law of gravity was fantastic until we started to think about action at a distance and go like, but, but the communication between two objects can't be faster than the speed of light. And then there was this next model, which was much more sophisticated, which explained things like the anomalous orbit of Mercury called general relativity. Exquisite, beautiful, built huge amounts of theory on it, even use GPS's work on general relativity, the satellites, until we realize it doesn't merge with quantum mechanics. So we've been looking for decades now at another model that merges them, and we haven't found it yet. They call it quantum gravity, but it hasn't been proven. I actually met someone at CERN who did a PhD in quantum gravity, <laughs> and he said to me, I said, why are you like, insanely smart? So Tim, why aren't you? Why are you not pursuing it? He says, "I got tired of go of going to conferences, presenting my work, and people laughing at me because <laughs> people just don't believe it because it hasn't been proven." So anyway, okay. Now we are now going to work with something very important. It's called conjugate acids and bases. All right. Ronsted Lowry conjugate acids and bases. Okay, so an acid forms a conjugate base after losing a proton. A base forms a conjugate acid after gaining a proton. A conjugate base can accept a proton to form again, form an acid again, and a conjugate acid can donate a proton and form a base again. Okay. Now you're thinking, my, oh my word, this is, seems complicated. It isn't. It isn't as long as you keep your cool. All right. And this is why I think it's so important to you as a foundation to work with the ionization and the dissociation equations. Right. So an acid forms a conjugate base after losing a proton. And the base forms a conjugate acid after gaining a proton. But now, because it's a conjugate base, it can accept a proton to become an acid again. And if something is a conjugate acid, it can donate a hydrogen ion in order to become a base. Okay? All right. But it's all going to make sense. Believe you me, it's going to make sense. All right. And I'm going to show you a method of how to do it. And it's really cool. And that's going to lead to amphilites. Yeah. Amphiprotic amph amphilites. Yeah. So one of the things I've learned about learning, not that I'm an expert by any means, is you always go back to the basics. Go back to what you know. Take a new concept and link it to an, an old concept, okay? Um, I think the fancy smart people, like my wife, who are educational researchers, they call it constructivism, where you take, you construct a knowledge structure by attaching it to something that already exists in your brain. Okay. So what is the most common acid that you know? Hydrochloric acid. Pool acid. Okay. So can I ask you, can we start, can you please write down the ionization equation for HCl reacting with water? And you are allowed to kukulu. You are allowed, allowed to go back and look, and I want you to rewrite it. I want you to rewrite it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, number one, the first example, Number one, we are going to, this is example one, I'm going to take HCl, I'm going to react it with water, all right, we're not going to do the Lewis diagrams, okay, it's going to be a strong ionization, we, we, we know this, it's going to be a weak recombination, the hydrogen ion is going to be donated, all right, so that's going to be the H+, plus, which remember, H+, plus is just a proton. It's going to leave behind a Cl-, minus, 
And what it's going to produce is going to be an H3O plus. All right. Now, would you agree with me? Because HCl produces a hydronium ion when it reacts with water, that it's an Arrhenius acid, according to the Arrhenius definition. You agree? Let's look at the Bronsted Lowry definition. Can you see that the HCl donates a proton? So, therefore, I'm going to say, I'm going to call this acid one. A1 is for acid one. Okay. Acid one is going to produce conjugate base one. And why do I say one? Because this is pair one. When the HCl does its job and donates the hydrogen ion as an acid, what it leaves behind is a conjugate base. Remember what, what we said here? We said an acid forms a conjugate base after losing a proton. All right. So the acid, once it's donated its hydrogen ion, its proton, it's what's left is a chloride ion that is the conjugate base. Do you agree with that? I'll show you why it's a base just now. Okay. Wait a minute. Didn't the water accept a proton? So therefore, it is base 2. But what does it produce? Well, if you have a conjugate base, if you have a, a, if a, ba a base forms a conjugate acid after gaining a proton, so this must be conjugate acid for pair 2. We have two pairs. So the water accepts a proton, therefore it makes it an, uh, a Bronsted-Lowry base. And by doing that, it becomes a conjugate acid. But ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Look what happens in reverse. When in reverse, the hydronium ion donates a proton to Cl minus. That's why it's a conjugate acid. Because in reverse, it donates a hydrogen ion to the chloride ion. And the chloride ion accepts a proton, so it's a conjugate base. Because according to the Bronsted Lowry theory, the substance that donates a proton is an acid. And the substance that accepts it is a base. And therefore, that's why this H3O, H3O plus, is the ultimate acid. Oh, you mean, Mr. D, that that's a strong conjugate acid? It's the ultimate acid. But it comes from a very weak base. Yes. Oh, you mean that the strength changes when you go from acid to conjugate or from base to conjugate? Oh, yeah. This is a strong acid, which makes the chloride ion a weak conjugate base. So the S is for strong. And the W is for weak. A is for acid, B is for base, C, C, A, sorry, C, B is conjugate base, and C, A is conjugate acid.
So, so I just want to ask, because um, I think I understood, why is it a strong acid like H3O? Because it's strong ionization. Okay. Look at this. Look at this. Look at the arrow length. But can you see in reverse? All right. You. Okay. Now you've got to say, oh, but wait a minute. This is a strong acid, absolutely. But this is a weak base. All right. So there's a lot more going on here than just it's not that simple. All right. You've got to look at something called the Ka and the Kb base, but you've also got to have a knowledge of equilibrium, which at this stage, you guys, we haven't done a lot of equilibrium. So that's H. Oh, H3O becomes strong acid because it gains. Okay, so if I can show you here, H3O plus is a strong acid. It's what makes an acid an acid. And OH minus is a strong base. It's the perfect hydroxide. The ultimate hydroxide is OH minus, and the ultimate acid is H3O plus. They're going to be strong. But this becomes very important when we look at something called hydrolysis of salts. Okay, now it's not always possible. It's not always easy to know whether some things are weak or strong. But can you see the chloride ion comes from a strong acid? So if it comes from a strong acid, it's going to be a weak conjugate base. It's a flip. Okay. Now, so, yes. Sorry, that, that's just rule of thumb. It's not rule of thumb, it's rule. <laughs> okay. It's going to happen. It's always going to happen. Okay. In school chemistry. In school chemistry. Okay. All right. Let's, let's try another one. Let's now go. And why don't we now go and look at... Example number two, why don't you give nitric acid a go? All right, so let's, let's look at HNO3 reacting with H2O. It's going to be strong ionization, weak recombination. All right, it's going to produce NO3 minus and it's going to produce H3O plus. But now what I want you to do, I'm going to ask you to do the following. I'm going to ask you, identify, this is example two. <coughs> identify the conjugate acid base pairs. The conjugate acid base pairs. We're going to do a whole. We're going to do a whole lot. The conjugate acid base pairs. Remember, you need to know certain of the chemicals. So we know nitric acid is a acid. So I'll start you off. This is acid one. What does it become when it donates the proton, the hydrogen ion? So this is going to become conjugate base one. Don't worry about strengths at this stage. Okay. Conjugate base one. Why? Because this is paired. So that's the first conjugate acid base pair. That's an acid conjugate base pair. But then you're going to have a base conjugate acid pair. All right. So this is going to be base one. And it's going to, not base one, base two, because this is pair two. And this is going to produce conjugate acid. Okay, now, do you have any of you ever dived into water and been corroded, acidified, burnt caustically? Water is always going to be a weak base. Agreed? Okay. So we know that water is a weak base, which means 
its conjugates can be strong. And we know that HNO3 is a strong acid, so nitrate ions going to be weak. Okay, so I'm going to give you another one. I want to give you this one. I want to give you NH3 plus H2O in H4 plus, does this ring a bell? Plus OH minus. Can you do the acid base? Can you do the uh, conjugate acid base pairs, please? One more word. The water is now an acid. Because it donates the proton in this reaction. Whereas in this one, it received the proton. Ah, amphibian, amphilite, amphiprotic. As a substance, it can behave like an acid or a base, depending on its context. Hmm. So this becomes base two. And this is conjugate acid two. Now we know that water is a weak acid. Oh, so it produces a strong conjugate base. But we know OH minus is kind of like the perfect hydroxide. It's always going to be strong. And we know that um, ammonia is a weak base, so it's going to produce a strong conjugate acid. Now, can I show you something? In reverse, the proton or hydrogen ion goes in that direction. In reverse, the proton goes in that direction. That is why, because this donates the hydrogen ion, it's an acid, and because this one receives it, it's a base. But because this one donates it, it's an acid, and this one is a base, but it receives it. Yes, Isabella. You can switch the pairs around. I generally start with pair one being where the acid donates the hydrogen. Yeah. I'm also confused because it causes ammonia conjugate acid, but just before the exception was called the base. Now, ammonia is a base, but ammonium is an ion. So, where did I say ammo ammonium and ammonia are not the same thing? Eh? Ammonia is a weak base. But ammonium has got a nice juicy hydrogen ion that he wants to give away. So ammonium is an acid. Ammonia is a base. Yeah. So yeah, it's language. It's language. It's language. Okay. Don't think ammonium and ammonia are the same thing. They're not. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen. An amphoteric, amphiprotic, amphilytic substance means it can 
you can buy it. <laughs> it means it can be acidic or basic depending upon the context okay so if we talk about something that is am an ampholite it's amphiprotic it's amphoteric this thing equals a substance that can behave as an acid or a base, depending on what it reacts with. So we have an example. Our example is water. Wow, we get even more amazed with the substance we drink every day. All right, it has the ability to behave as an acid or as a base. So, when you talk about amphiprotic, you're using the Bronsted Lowry model. Protos. Proton donor, proton acceptor. When you use amphilite or amphoteric, you're using the Arrhenius method. Okay, of defining acids and most. Now, I want to blow your minds with something that really not going to make sense initially, all right? But it's super important, super important. Okay. Um, Number three, or number C, sorry, it's C, has a very special name. This process is known as the auto-ionization of water. The auto-ionization of water. So, I'm going to do, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going, to, I'm going to use a Lewis diagram because it's that important. I'm going to do it again. Now, you've got two water molecules. Now, we know water is very, very stable. But once in a pink moon, when they collide, They'll collide at the right energy and the right orientation that there will be a breaking up of one of the molecules. And there will be a donation of a hydrogen ion to the other water molecule. Now, the ionization reaction is so small that it's virtually non-existent. Okay? But it's, it does happen. So what it leaves behind, what it leaves behind is a hydroxide ion. And what it produces is a hydronium ion. And the reverse reaction is huge. The recombination is massive. Okay. So what we have here, and I'm going to draw it in non-Lewis diagram. We're going to go, we have H2O plus H2O, and they form they pure liquids, is going to ionize, there's going to be a massive recombination. It's going to produce OH minus aqueous plus Hydronium ion aqueous. Now, why we call it auto ionization is because it just statistically happens. It's auto automatic. Okay. But now um, I need to. So, so the auto ionization is in actual fact this step here. 
Right, let's just use Bronsted Lowry. Okay, so the one that donates the proton, that is the acid. Let's call it acid one, but it produces a conjugate base one. This is pair one. Base two of pair two lands up producing conjugate acid two. This is pair two. Now, we know that water is both a weak acid and a weak base, which means it's going to produce the ultimate acid and the ultimate base, which are super strong. But they're so strong that they reverse so quickly that the hydrogen ion gets donated so quickly that you don't pick up the hydronium ion and hydroxide ion concentrations but they're important enough that they give us this relationship and i'm writing it down now because we are going to use it later on that the concentration of the hydroxide ion of the hydronium ion multiplied by the concentration of the hydroxide ion is 10 to the negative 14 at the room temperature. This is known as KW. It's got a very, it's a very, very specific constant in acids and base chemistry. Oh, you see this 14 here? That is why our pH scale is from 0 to 14. This 14 has something to do with pH scale. Okay. But 10 to the negative 14 is 1 in a 100 trillion. Chew on that. So this is a very, very weak process. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next level. I'm almost done. I've got 10 minutes left. Let's move on. Oh, by the way, you can write this as 2H2O producing that. Okay, it's in the notes. Not, I prefer to write it explicitly. Let's now look at polyprotic ionization. Let's look at polyprotic ionization. So we're going to start with H2SO4. All right. So now we're going to start with ionization equation one. We have H2SO4 plus H2O. This will be a strong ionization. We're going to have a collision between this molecule and a single hydrogen ion proton is donated. What this leaves behind is HSO4 minus. Ooh, this is a weird, this is a weird intermediary substance. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the collisions, there's very seldom is an H2SO4 going to eat two water molecules at the same time and give both its hydrogen ions out immediately. Okay, so your, your, your sulfuric acid hits a water molecule. At the right orientation with enough energy, its hydrogen ion gets donated, it leaves an electron behind. This is neutral. It leaves behind one less hydrogen with its electron. This leaves an H sulfate ion there. All right, now, what is it produced? Well, it's produced a hydronium ion. Okay, now I want you to leave three lines. Three lines. What is Sorry? Is HSO4 acid? Is it just... Wait, wait. It's a good... No, it's not a wrong... It's not a bad question at all. I'm going to answer it. It's both... Wait. <laughs> ionization equation two. Ionization equation two. 
this HSO4 minus <coughs> now is in solution. And now, it is going to react with another water molecule. The first ionization equation dictates whether it's strong or weak. The second one is not actually that important, not on school level. So we don't, we don't really need to know which way it goes. Okay? So we just, that, that this is the important one. But now it donates its second hydrogen ion. Ah, polyprotic. And now what does it form? It forms SO4, 2 minus, plus the hydronium ion. All right. Now, first things first. Let's go to the Bronsted-Lowry acid and base, conjugate acid base pairs. Ya is acid one. It becomes conjugate base one in pair one. Do you agree? H2SO4 donates one hydrogen ion. The acid now becomes HSO4 minus, which is the conjugate base. Okay. Yeah. P2. We have base 2, which now becomes conjugate acid 2 for P2. Right. Now, if you look in reverse, the reverse reaction. The hydrogen ion will go in this direction when recombination takes place. That's why it's an acid. Okay? We're good. Acid 1 becomes conjugate base 1. Base 2 becomes conjugate acid 2. And remember, it's reversible. This process could go in the opposite direction. But because it's strong, the reverse process is not dominant. But now you have a whole lot of HSO4 minus. And now, what does it do when it collides with water? It acts as an acid. Ah, these intermediaries are amphoteric. They're amphibious. They can behave as acids and bases. So in the second step, this becomes acid 3, part of P3. P3, and this becomes conjugate base 3. All right. Now, it's receiving the proton. So this is base 4 in P4. <coughs> and this becomes conjugate base 4. So the intermediary substance behaves as a base when it acts like this and behaves as an acid like this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's conjugate acid. My bad, my bad. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, Isabella. Absolutely. That would be conjugate acid form. Definitely. Right, so when it reacts in reverse, it would be donating its proton, and so this would be a base. But now, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at the net ionization equation. The, I'm almost done. The net ionization equation. If we now Look at this. We've got H2SO4 on the left-hand side. All right. We have an H2O and an H2O, which is a two H2Os. We have two proton donations. We have two proton donations. All right. These HSO4 minuses or those HSO4 minuses which disappear, basically. We have, this becomes SO4 2 minus 
plus two hydronium ions. But wait a minute, Mr. D. This is what we did last week. When I showed you diprotic, what I didn't show you last week is the intermediary step. But this, yeah, that intermediary substance is always going to be amphiprotic because on this side it is a base and on that side it's an acid. Okay, so, right, so if you look here, this one, this one is a strong acid, this one's a weak conjugate base. This is a weak base, this is a strong conjugate acid, okay? This is a weak conjugate base, that's going to be a strong acid when it acts as an acid, that's going to produce a weak conjugate base. This is a weak base, it's going to produce a strong conjugate acid. But I, I, I'm mentioning it to you, although explicitly in the syllabus, we don't really test the strengths in this context. But I'm not done with you. I want to give you homework. Okay. And I get a nice smile on my face. And what a nice gift for you. All right. And he has the gift. Phosphoric acid. It's triprotic. So this was polyprotic ionizations. This was this was example. Let's see, this was C. This was D. So what I want you to do, and I'm leaving it to you, this is the homework. I want you to write down, you've got H3. PO4 plus three H2Os it's going to donate three hydrogen ions to ultimately produce <coughs> PO4 three minus which is the phosphate ion Okay, plus three hydronium ions. But what I want you to do, this, this is the net ionic equation. Sorry, not ionic, ionization equation. I want you to do the following. I want you to write out ionization equation one. Ionization equation two, ionization equation three. Remem remembering that every ionization is the donation of only one proton. All right, and then at the end, sum up so that you get the net ionization equation. I will post this on classroom. All right. So you are going to start. I'll start you off. You are going to start. Yeah, you're going to start with H three P O four plus one H two O, and you're going to donate one hydrogen ion, which is a proton. You're not going to worry about the arrow lengths. And so we don't have to mention like strengths and weaknesses. No, you don't. Only you don't. No, you don't. You don't. I just, I'm just, I'm just. I, there's a reason why I do it. It's not in the syllabus, but there's a reason why I do it. I do it so you so you can understand hydrolysis of salts better. Okay. There is a hidden agenda as to why I do it. It's not so hidden. I'm telling you why I'm doing it. You don't really need. We don't. They don't when they ask you these questions, they ask you identify the Bronsted Lowry acids and base conjugate acid and base pairs, and never ask about strengths. Not in, not in school level. All right. I leave that to you. That is your homework. I apologize for being two minutes over time. Have a wonderful afternoon. May the force be with you.